recording. So am I going now? Yes. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Backyard Birding, Bird Feeding, Avian Entertainment. My name is Iris Altilio. I'm an ARP volunteer. I'm going to be your host for tonight's presentation. And as you already know, we are recording this event. You will not be seen, though, because your cameras and microphones are disabled. Uh, Bev Cotton is working with me. She's another AARP volunteer. She's going to be helping with registration. So she may be um, she may be chatting with you to confirm your name if she can't match it to the list that we have. And then we're also, Bev and I are also going to be handling the questions. You have the option, excuse me, of using the Q&A or the chat for your questions, whichever you're most comfortable with. Um, so if you have questions, please put them out there. We will feed them to our presenter throughout the program. We're going to do them at breaks. Um, we're going to do them at breaks in the program that are logical for the most part. Um, what I did want to mention is if you're chatting and you want everyone to see your question or your comment, please make sure that you're chatting to everyone and not just host and panelists. Before we get started, we do have a couple housekeeping items. Um, well, I already mentioned the chat, so I think I covered our main housekeeping item actually. Uh, so now at ARP New Hampshire, we're focused on the health, the financial security, and social connections critical to the well being of the 50 plus in our Granite State. Our work frequently focuses on livable communities. Did you know there's approximately 45 million Americans aged 65 and older? And by 2030, that number is going to reach 30, 73 million Americans. At that point, fully one in five Americans will be older, older than 65. And by 2034, the United States, and this is for the first time ever, is going to be a country compromised of more older adults than of children. AARP supports the efforts of neighborhoods, towns, cities, and rural areas to be great places for people of all ages. We believe that communities should provide safe, walkable streets, age-friendly housing and transportation options, access to needed services, and opportunities for residents of all ages to participate in community life. We've been working closely with the nature education opportunities and hope that our co collaborative Sorry, I can't get that word out. Collaboration continues to open doors literally for Granite Staters 50 and plus. But what is nature education opportunities? Well, our host and presenter tonight is Kelly Dwyer, and she's the founder of Nature Education Opportunities. She's also an award-winning environmental educator, and she's a certified New Hampshire elementary teacher. She's been creating and delivering engaging programs for audiences of all ages for over 50 years, including one a couple months ago that was really exciting, which is why I'm back today. So as a certified wellness coach, Kelly also brings a great understanding of the numerous benefits of connecting with the natural world to reduce stress, to improve health, and embrace a more mindful approach to life and learning. Kelly, thank you for joining us tonight, for coming back again, and for teaching us how to create impactful, safe, and entertaining backyard birding, bird feeding options. Wow. Thank you very much, Iris. That was a, a lovely, warm introduction. And it's interesting, I'm going to be just sort of showcasing my wellness coaching hat right now. As I open our slide here, we see uh, avian entertainment. Not only we'll be talking about the entertaining factor that birds can provide, but also sort of that opportunity for you on the other side of the glass to decompress, to sort of have that moment where you can maybe grab a cup of coffee or tea, sit down, take a deep breath. Um, I'm never far from my binoculars. And this is another thing I suggest that folks, if you don't have them, it might be a wonderful holiday gift that you can put on your list for family. And to sit there yeah. and really take your eyes off a screen or device and watch what's happening in your backyard bird feeding setup. So it does provide an opportunity to really hone our power of observation and our connection with nature by setting up something like this. So I think it, it checks a lot of boxes for me. So I will take my wellness coaching hat off and put my naturalist hat on as we go forward. Um, so this is just to, to give folks an overview of what we'll cover this evening. There's just so much to talk about with when it comes to backyard bird feeding, but my goal is to really present a program that gives you a little bit more information a sense if you're new to this, 
what to do going forward. If you've been a seasoned backyard bird feeder, maybe some additional information, how you can improve your habitat and address some of those challenges and mitigation strategies to make it a safer, healthier environment for not only the birds, but for you as well. So we'll just spend a moment or two on why birds are around this winter. What are they doing? How have they arrived at this point in the year and what's been happening for, uh, months prior? I will go over what I call the avian feeder guests. I tend to present this as um, the dining options. I use an analogy of a, a wonderful restaurant. So we'll be kind of coming at it from that point of view. So you can tell I love to eat out and I love to cook. So I can't help but go to that. Um, so I'm gonna be showcasing a, uh, the birds that you should expect to see just very quickly, many of them you're familiar with. And a good field guide is an essential part too if you're learning about the birds that you have in your neighborhood. And then we'll spend some time on what type of feeders to offer as well as the food offering. Again, using that restaurant analogy as we get in. And then I, I think it's really critical to how do we address the safety of our birds and as well as, as us as homeowners and offering this for um, the birds and, as well as other animals. All right, so let's kind of take a step back and, and look at what birds have been doing throughout the year. So it gives us a real appreciation of the challenges that they'll be looking at as we come into winter. Here in New Hampshire, I don't know, some we may have some folks from other states, but um, it's been extremely warm the last few weeks. So I feel like winter is going to come at us really with, with its teeth bared pretty soon. But if we think back to spring, the songbirds that we will be expecting to see at our feeders were really busy establishing those territories and thinking about nesting. There was a lot of singing, chasing, establishing nests and grabbing mates. So very, very busy with that particular function. As summer came about, those birds that had successful nests were raising those little nestlings. And if anybody has raised children or grandchildren, you know that's a really full-time occupation and then some. And as those birds were starting to leave the nests and become fledglings, the parents were really stepping up in terms of feeding those birds, those baby birds were learning to fly. So they really had a high energy demand to keeping track of all of that. And many of our songbirds have multiple broods or multiple nests throughout the spring and into the summer. So they've been very busy. As fall started uh, a couple of months ago, the, the daylight started to wane a little bit many of the birds that we're now looking at outside, we're starting to shift their behavior and their focus on molting. That's when they lose those feathers that um, become quite tattered over the course of the, the breeding season. And I know just <laughs> raising my family, I wish I could have molted my feathers and got sort of a fresh new appearance come the fall because it, it, is a, it is quite a lot of energy, again, raising young. And then some of these birds that are up here in the summer and spring are now have migrated for warmer climates. And we'll talk in a moment about why they do that. So the ones that are staying around for the winter are really preparing in certain ways for that survival. And now we enter the season, the time of year where it is strictly about survival. So for those of you who are um, have been feeding birds all the year or been watching birds, you'll really notice that behavior change. Things are quiet. There's really no song, there's no need to sing, nobody's trying to attract a mate at this time of year. It's simply conserving energy to survive. So that just gives us a little bit of context of what birds have been doing. Um, I, yes. do, I do have one question that I do wanna ask now, and it's are you sure. covering feeding in all regions or is it gonna be really concentrating on New Hampshire and North? This is, it's primarily, um, I I think the strategies that I will be talking about would be applicable to New England or even the Northeast or even some of the East Coast. Um, but I, I, I would imagine some of the general concepts, Iris, would be the same as far as the cleanliness of our feeders um, and what to offer. But folks chiming in from other parts of the country, you may have different species of birds that may prefer different food. Um, so, but I think the premise would be relatively the same, if that helps. Um, so if we think about migrants versus resident, those birds, like I mentioned, that are now have migrated away for the, the remainder of the winter, a great example is the ruby-throated hummingbird. So this little bird is quite adapted to the cold that this uh, particular, our region here in the Northeast would present. 
However, there's not availability of food. Think about the flowers and the little small insects that are flying, that many of those songbirds that are here for the duration of the summer, the food is not available. So therefore, migration is a strategy to survive the winter and to migrate to warmer climates. Um, and again, migration is a really serious business. That's a high energy, high challenging time for birds to leave an area and navigate all of the different challenges, weather, buildings, habitat loss. So it's not something that's undertaken lightly. It's, it's necessitated by lack of food. So tonight we'll be focusing really on those birds that we call residents. They were here all year and they're staying through most of the winter here with us. So let's kind of take a look at some of those strategies that birds have adapted to really survive the winter. Um, one of the, the things that you'll probably notice if you have your feeders up or if you're ready to put them up, this is something you'll see pretty quickly, is this flocking together. Birds almost seem like a bus pulled up and several different species will get off and approach your feeders at different times of the day. And this is great um, if you have a bird notebook and you wanna make some observations of who you're seeing at what time, sit, uh, take care of those, take track rather of those patterns. But birds tend to flock together this time of year. There's a lot more harmony with say a group of chickadees that are coming to the feeders or other birds with each other because there's not that territory um, challenge that spring brings to kind of get your own setup ready. So flocking together is a strategy. And this also enables birds to really keep an eye out for predators so that safety in numbers is a really a strong um, thing that happens this time of year. Many birds are able to cache or store food. If you see certain birds that are arriving to your feeders and they'll grab a seed and they'll fly off, oftentimes they're caching or storing it for retrieval later. Chickadees are famous for this. Um, several other birds that we'll talk about have this strategy. So it's almost like the buffet's open and they need to take advantage of the food while it's available. Um, I just wanna pause here and, and make a comment that many of um, researchers have looked at is offering food through a feeder situation affecting the bird's behavior to find food in the wild? And pretty conclusively, the studies are showing that no, it does not. It's really more for our enjoyment, our entertainment, and our connection with nature, which ultimately leads us to want to preserve habitats and preserve species. So it's really a benefit in that sense to a lot of the birds, but it will not interrupt their natural ability to find food. So if you're taking a vacation and you have no one to fill your feeders, please don't worry about it. There's plenty of food in, in the natural environment. Another strategy that birds use is called torpor. This is, it's like, it's like a hibernation in the sense, but it's a time limited. So they have the ability, particularly in a cold night, to lower their body temperature, lower respiration, lower heart rate, all aimed toward conserving energy. So that's a real um, critical strategy that they use. Roosting, a lot of these small songbirds, for example, the chickadees and bluebirds and titmice will roost together, almost like um, they kind of get into a, a nest box or a hole, a cavity in a tree, or even along a branch in an evergreen. And by huddling together, they're conserving warmth. And then the final strategy, there's a lot more research coming out on this one, communication, that it was considered for a long time that Birds didn't understand each other's language, and that really has been debunked. That birds, and it makes sense when you think about it, to really survive and be pretty adapted at your environment, you need to understand what's going on. So when that chickadee, for example, has an alarm call to other chickadees, other animals are able to interpret that and understand what that means. So it's a, it's a lot of exciting work now being done on bird communication. So these are some of the general strategies that birds use again, to try to get through the winter because this is the most challenging time. And if you think about a species maintaining its numbers, a bird just needs to replicate or reproduce itself over the course of its lifespan for species populations to remain stable. But uh, it's a really a challenging time. About 80% of birds that were, were hatched this year, young birds do not make it into next spring. So it's a high mortality time for many of the birds that stay around here. Okay, so now what we're going to do, as I mentioned, there's um, a lot of guests that will arrive at your restaurant. So I just wanna point out um, the species profile we'll go through. Many of them are familiar to you. 
If you are from other parts of the country, I apologize. They may be some that are sort of throughout the US, but these are ones primarily that we would see uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. And so to quote, the black cap chickadee is our uh, many people's favorite. It's a little acrobatic bird that's quite curious. And uh, I read recently that chickadees are able to deliberately have certain neurons die off in the fall in their brain to create more space and capacity for different neurons to, um, to grow, to study changes to their environment, their habitat and flock communication. So again, chickadees have that other adaptation and I don't know if it applies to other birds, I suspect it probably does. Up to titmouse, this is a, a wonderful bird that has expanded its range northward from further south in the US over the last 50 years. It's a um, beautiful big black eye that's kind of a, a fun little bird to have around. You can see that it's crest and that crest is used for communication. So if you notice, and again, this is it's fun to be observing things at your feeders. If the titmouse crest is down, it can be a sign of deference to another bird or it can also be a sign of almost like pre-aggression. So keep an eye on what happens with the titmouse's tuft at your feeders. Uh, White-breasted nuthatch. This is a, a dear little bird that is able to navigate up and down um, the tree, a vertical surface, quite adeptly. And I love the look of the nuthatch because it almost looks like it's painted. And very rarely do you see the ruffled feathers of a nuthatch. Um, a fun little bird that's quite curious. And nuthatch are notorious for taking a black oil sunflower seed and sticking it underneath a shingle or your roof, or if you can watch them, really kind of hide it in the crevice of, of bark. So they're ones to keep an eye on when they leave your feeder with a seed. Where do they go and what are they doing? Again, the binoculars come in handy for that. Blue jays. Um, blue jays are members of the corvid family, which includes ravens, crows, and they're the smallest group of the, of the corvids. Highly intelligent birds. So blue jays are um, really masters of the feeder situation. They're able to mimic a hawk because it's almost their problem solving. If they see a lot of birds at the feeders, they can mimic a hawk, which initially would clear the feeders. Birds think that there's an avian predator about so keep an eye on this behavior. If you suddenly hear what appears to be a hawk noise and, and then the feeder's clear and a blue jay swoops in, it was the blue jay mimicking the hawk. So again, incredible advantage, but quickly birds sort of catch on to what's going on. Um, blue jays are able to cache or store acorns and seeds in um, what's called a gull or pouch. It's very similar flap of skin to like say a pelican. So keep an eye on your blue jays. I've seen them have probably, I would say maybe a quarter a cup of seed to a third a cup of black oil sunflower seeds in their pouch. It almost looks like they have a big swollen throat by the time they're done and fly off. And what they're doing is they're caching and storing those seeds. They're not actually ingesting them or eating them all. Blue jays, like all other songbirds, have to hold the seed in their feet and crack it open with their bill. So I, I would love to know where they're going with all my seeds. I think there's probably 40 pounds out somewhere in the woods just from the Blue Jays the last week. Okay, Northern, Northern Cardinals. This is um, a favorite of many people, especially this time of year. It's sort of that quintessential um, Christmas time bird, the holiday season. And I don't know of any card that doesn't have a Cardinal featured on it. And for good reason, they're really beautiful bird. The female on the left um, has more of that coffee colored drab camouflage color, which is uh, very important for protecting her and the young on the nest. The male, um, really quite bright red. The coloration of the male's feathers, the, the vibrancy of the red depends on his diet. So as they get into spring, it would really signal if there's a bright, gorgeous red cardinal that that bird is able to supply a potential mate and young with a really reliable food source. So it's an advertisement for that particular male. Um, cardinals are those species that are typically the very first ones to your feeders and the last ones to leave at dusk. I've seen them where the light is just so low, you can tell them only by their silhouette. So they, uh, they're quite loyal to feeders. Again, another species, just like some of the other ones we've talked about that have expanded their range northward um, within the last 50 or 70 years. 
Okay, the goldfinch. This um, dear little bird is uh, smaller than a chickadee. And I, when I um, worked at Audubon for years, I used to get a lot of calls about, I see the strange little bird. It looks like it could be a goldfinch shape, but it's not yellow. Well, what happens is goldfinch is one of those unusual birds that has a second molt of its plumage. It loses those sort of tattered feathers of parenting that we talked about in the fall, but then it will actually grow these beautiful yellow feathers and change into its summer plumage. You can see the male. These are both males, by the way, these both photos. So that male on the right would be one as we come into um, probably into April. And ironically, the goldfinch is one of the light, latest songbirds to nest. It times its nesting for the, the thistle down to line its nest. So it's usually until late July here in New Hampshire before the goldfinch even starts to set up a nesting site. But uh, goldfinch are really lovely little, little birds to come to your feeders. Oftentimes there's a whole flock of them. So it's it's fun to uh, to see them in, um, I, when I did the program back a couple of months ago about autumn wonders, what we can do to increase our habitat naturally in our yard by leaving your seed heads up of all of your perennials and maybe even some of your wildflowers, goldfinch are those species that will come and just absolutely be excited to see the echinacea or the conehead flowers, the seed heads with their thin little bills, they're able to get in there and, and dine quite easily. Okay, red-bellied woodpecker, again, another species that um, our grandparents and even our parents may not have seen because it's expanded its range northward more recently than some of the other birds we talked about. Um, but woodpeckers have a special adaptation on their feet. They have four toes, like all other songbirds, and they have, it's called zygodactyl. So there's your, uh, there's your cocktail party word to ask people, do you know what zygodactyl is? It's the ability for two toes up and two toes down. So they have really good sturdy um, balance as they go up and down a vertical surface. So all wood woodpeckers have that ability to have zygodactyl feet. So the female is on the left. She does not have the complete red head like the male on the right. All right, house finch. Um, house finch, for those of you who may be kind of calling in from the Western part of the country, this is a more native species for, um, for you. We have house finch that were introduced from um, 19, around the 1940s. There were a lot of pet shops that were selling these illegally. And so they had to suddenly, you know, before they were investigated, open the doors, open the cages and out went the house finch that had been taken from the West. So they were released, um, I won't say accidentally because it was deliberate, but what happened is they really prol proliferated. And now we have house finch that are here um, unfortunately, they are the ones that are more susceptible to several diseases that we'll talk about in a little bit because they're not so much um, a native species here, and they've had a lot of low diversity in terms of their, um, their um, genetics. So they used to call them the Hollywood finch, apparently, back before 1940s. So you will see most likely house finch on your feeders. And you will also hopefully see our state bird here in New Hampshire, the purple finch. And oftentimes these get confused at the feeder. So I just wanna take a moment and point out a couple of sort of uh, field marks that to look for so you can tell the difference. So let's start with the purple finch. You can see the male on the, on the left, looks like in my mind that he was dipped in raspberry juice. And the female, which is more drab and, and muted as um, some of our female birds are, but she looks like she has a little bit more streaking. And also a key for her is this white eyebrow stripe. It looks like someone took an eraser and erased those beige feathers around her eye, as well as her tail. If you look at the end of her tail, it's quite notched, as opposed to the house finch. If we kind of take a look at the male, he really only has that reddish coloration around his head and the very beginning of his chest. The female of the house finch is, is quite, um, quite muted. There's really not prominent streaking in her and she does not have that eyebrow stripe and her tail looks more rounded or even blunt compared to the purple finch. So keep an eye out um, for these birds at your feeders. Bluebirds, this uh, really gets a lot of people excited now that the bluebird population, at least here in the Northeast is increasing. Um, they were, 
there are native species, obviously, that were really dependent on a lot of fields that were as a result of the agricultural past here in New Hampshire. And as things became more forested, their habitat shrunk. They um, depend on other species to excavate a nest cavity, like a abandoned woodpecker nest, a cavity nesters. But there's been competition with several introduced species, we'll talk in a moment, that have uh, really brought the bluebird numbers down. But because so many people love them and have been putting up nest boxes or bluebird nest trails, the success rate has been really phenomenal and their numbers are increasing uh, quite rapidly, which is a good thing. The bluebirds are a member of the thrush family. They're a cousin of the robin. So if you kind of look at that profile, you see that it does look like a little robin with that really prominent big belly that robins have, as well as that white eye ring around the female on the left. So bluebirds are um, somewhat partial migrants. If they can find food in the form of berries or even suet or mealworms at feeders, they will stay around. Um, if not, they, like robins, they will migrate sort of partially down to more the mid-Atlantic. So for those of you who might be in the mid-Atlantic states, you may see a lot of bluebirds that we have here in the summertime. Okay, Carolina wren uh, is one of the most recent birds, again, to expand its range from the south. Carolina wrens, um, unfortunately, really severe winters here in the northeast will sort of knock the numbers back. I, I don't think they're quite as adapted yet to some of the harsher conditions that that folks here in the Northeast can face. But um, these are uh, really probably in my mind, the most inquisitive little birds. They're always found pecking around the foundation um, in and out of any type of shed opening that you have. So just be careful. I had a situation where I have a, a glass room off my house and a few months ago I had Carolina wrens around and I left the slider uh, door just cracked for a moment when I ran inside to answer the phone. And luckily I had shut the slider door to the house because when I looked back out, there was a wren that was in my, my room because again, they're very nosy. So just beware, you, you can't trust a little crack in a door or window if you have wrens around, but they are really quite fun. Their song is beautiful. And if you do happen to have any of those sort of woven grass nest balls with a little opening, they will often use those to roost at night, particularly in the winter. So it's kind of, uh, an idea to put those out and you might entice a Carolina wren to stay in there for the for the evening. Okay, when I mentioned with the bluebirds how they were threatened um, by an introduced species, house sparrows, or actually the weaver finch, they are from England, they're not native here to North America, they were introduced in the mid 1800s, and they are um, quite adapted, quite ag aggressive, and really intelligent birds in the sense of um, they've done quite well. So they do threaten the, um, the comp their competition for a lot of the cavity nesters like the bluebirds, the chickadees, the titmice. If you do happen to have house sparrows um, it, that really are becoming quite a problem in your feeder situation, they tend to be a little bit more urban, but certainly out in more suburban communities, we can experience them. It might be an idea just to take your feeders in for a bit and see if they kind of disperse and go somewhere else. Same thing with the European starling, obviously just by the nature of its name, we know that it's not a native species here. Um, starlings come in these huge gregarious flocks and, and they, I don't think there's any flock that flies as beautiful synchronized flight as a starling. I know they can become quite problematic at airports Often airports will have hawks that are there that will deter them because they can really wreak havoc with airplane jet engines. So um, starlings for the most part stay in an urban area, but um, I have about 2000 acres of conservation land and every January and February I am overrun by a flock of starlings for a couple of week period of time and I just take my feeders in. So um, you never know where they'll show up. Okay, morning dove uh, is a, cousin of the pigeon, you can see their behavior is somewhat pigeon-like, rock dove, but morning doves tend to be um, ground feeders, and I, I find them personally kind of uh, fun to watch because they are, they do mate for life, so it, God, they come in these flocks in the wintertime. I was watching a flock out in my yard before we got on the program this evening, and there was 20 morning doves I counted, and it was interesting. It was like a bell went off. There was one group of about I could count eight quickly that flew in one direction and then the other ones were staged 
and they flew in another direction to roost for the night. And there were two left, this pair, I'm assuming they were a pair, and almost like they looked at each other as if, I don't know, do you think it's time to go? And then they, they take off, they fly very quickly. And the noise that they make when they fly, it's not a vocalization. It sounds like a, it's actually a stiff flight feather that because they do fly so rapidly, wind whistles over that feather and makes that noise. So they're, they're personally one of my favorites, and, but they can really kind of cause a lot of angst among other birders. Downy woodpeckers, a common little uh, backyard bird that we uh, find here that do love to roost in nest boxes at night. So if you do have nest boxes in your property, make sure they're cleaned out and then you probably will be able to attract a downy woodpecker to nest. Hairy woodpecker is, a, is a, a larger version of the downy, but pretty much the same thing. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, recently I was reading that um, downy woodpeckers, and I imagine this would extrapolate to the hairies as well, are able to recognize each other by the patterns of the black and white feathering on their back. Almost like how we can recognize facial features of each other so we can tell each other apart. That's apparently how they're able to tell um, each other from uh, you know, other members of the flock. Male here is on the left with a little red barrette on the back. Female is just all black and white feathering. Okay, so let's chat for a minute about those birds that actually migrate further south every single year for, um, for the winter time. So we think about migration as those birds leaving here the Northeast and going to warmer climates in the Caribbean or Central South America. But there are those birds that actually do come from the North on a pretty regular basis. The dark-eyed junco is a high elevation boreal forest nester. So if you're ever up in the mountains of New Hampshire and Vermont, for example, or Maine in the summertime, you may see juncos in their natural um, nesting habitat up there but they do come down here and they arrive typically in September around here in, in New Hampshire. The white-throated sparrow is another one that is a high elevation nester, but this bird for us here in New Hampshire only will stay for a couple of weeks and then go further south. So if you're in Southern um, New England or even into the mid-Atlantic, you probably have white-throated sparrows that you'd be able to entice to the feeder area underneath. Um, the ground under your feeders. All right, I want to make a note um, because this is some exciting news that I can actually verify that I just had some um, experience with it this evening. Some of these birds are what we call eruptive species. These are the birds that are all high elevation or boreal forest into Canada and the maritime nesters that we don't see year to year. We don't see them very often on a regular basis like the juncos. They're eruptive, so it, certain conditions need to be in play for them to actually move further south for the winter looking for food. And um, there's a group that's called the Finch Research Network that, that looks at all of the food sources, the, like the ash crop, the cedar crop, and some of the other um, hemlock forests up in Canada to see what the mast crop or the seed crop looks like. And they can make predictions based on if it's a poor year, that would obviously drive birds further south looking for food. So let's kind of chat about who we can expect to see. The Finch Report anticipates every one of these species is very likely to move south into feeders in the Northeast and probably in the Mid-Atlantic this year. So the one on the top left is what we call a pine siskin. It looks exactly like a goldfinch in terms of its size, only it's heavily streaked and the male, you can see, has a little wash of yellow on its wing. So I was actually sitting a couple of hours ago having a snack um, in my classroom where I have a feeder that I'll show you in a moment. And I looked up and there was the first siskin of the year. So I can absolutely verify that they are on the move. The next one over is um, the common red pole. Looks very similar to the siskin, the same size with a little, um, almost like a little maroon beret on. And then we have over to the right, the pine grosbeak. And down below, we have the evening gross beak. So these are birds to keep an eye on in your feeders. They are anticipated to be moving south um, and they're kind of on their way. All right, so let's kind of chat about different types of feeders. But be before, I was gonna say, Iris, before okay. we get into that, this is a natural break if there's any questions about any of the, the feeder guests that you can expect. Well, we have 
three questions came in. One of them was, and how do you how do you humanely deter cats? Um, yeah, that's a, uh, hopefully um, that is the number one challenge to birds. The number one reason that a lot of birds are in decline. So obviously, if you if it, if it's your home and you have an outdoor cat, you don't put your feeders up because that's the responsible thing to do. If it's a neighbor's cat. Um, it's, I've had this happen where I've tried to have a conversation with the neighbor just to sort of do some gentle light education and it didn't work. So I had this cat that would just stealthily come around my feet. So what I had to do is make sure that there was enough sort of open space around my feeders that the birds really had the opportunity to see that potential predator. And if it really comes to a point where you're finding a cat from the neighborhood taking birds, um, then it might be worth just putting your feeders away for a bit to, um, so that you're mitigating that, that situation. Okay, thank you. We have, um, Linda said she was told that the balls that you mentioned are not good for the birds because they can get their claws caught and even break their legs. The, the what aren't good the, for the birds? The balls, right? the balls, the nesting balls you mentioned. Oh. The LLS balls. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've used them for years on my front porch and I've never experienced that. I suppose anything is possible, um, but I, the ones that I get have, they're so tightly woven that they're almost like a solid wood-like material. So I think that's probably something to just be careful if there are a lot of gaps in the, the weaving or the, the weave, then it probably isn't a quality item. Okay. Uh, we had a couple more come in. I can't pronounce this word. It's are L-E-U-C-I-T-I-C -I -I -C birds shunned by others of the same species? Yes, um, I, I can never pronounce this right. It's like, it's a, they're basically albinism, al albinism. Um, so there are birds that just wouldn't have the pigment to produce feathers. And yes, they are. I've seen that with a chickadee that was completely white, completely an albino chickadee. And it was an absolute pariah. The other chickadees would not allow it to even have anything to do with my yard. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of an interesting observation. If you see any of that, birds that have um, lack of pigmentation, it might be completely throughout their whole body or it could be just certain parts of their, their body. So it's, it's just a, a lack of pigment. It's nothing that's a disease, but it does cause some curious behavior. You think that, you know, animals would be a lot more accepting, but apparently mm -hmm. um, they also have some bias. <laughs> Uh, this sounds like a good one. Somebody wants to know um, what month or time of year is it safe to clean out the nest boxes so you're not disturbing anything? Sure. Um, here in the Northeast, every bird is done with nest boxes by, um, by August or September. You're absolutely safe to do it then heading into fall. Okay. Um, this couple more came in. You can tell me when to stop. This is very New Hampshire. Uh, how do you handle birds and wild uh, bears and wild turkeys at your feeder? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get into bears with the challenge right. category. Um, mm -hmm. And wild turkeys, we can discuss it then too. So if we can just sort of park that for a moment, we will get to that. Good question. Um, and one last one, she sure. said, or Nancy said that she's been putting her feeders out later because of the recommendations to avoid bears, but she finds that she's seeing fewer birds than she used to see when she fed year round. And she was wondering if you had any suggestions. Sure, I think what's happened, well, generally bird populations are, are um, going down. So we're, we're having, for the most part, population, they're not plummeting all of them, but we've, we are definitely seeing fewer and fewer birds because of so many challenges like climate change, habitat loss, um, other prime things that are really bringing numbers down. Uh, this time of year, there's also, you figure in the Northeast and New Hampshire, it's been so mild. So there's still a lot of natural food. So I haven't had many uh, birds in my yard because they're in the woods, they're in the fields, they're in the marshes, still eating a lot of the natural food. And we tend to see an increase in the birds at backyard feeders once we've had the first couple of snowstorms and the weather really becomes more challenging. So those are a couple of factors that may explain why the feeders seem a little bit um, sparse. 
There was just one more comment. I don't know that it's a question. And Lisa said she doesn't get cardinals and goldfinch. Doesn't know why, but she does get mm -hmm. goldfinch. Okay. Well, yeah, that's, um, I, I'm not sure where Lisa is, if they're, you know, uh, but they tend to be a very prolific species, especially the cardinals. They are usually a, a real stalwart of the feeders. So uh, maybe we could, as we're getting into this next category, there might be some information that would be helpful to Lisa in terms of what to offer the cardinals, because they are, they're pretty specific with what they eat. So on that note, I think I'll kind of launch into, um, like I mentioned before, looking at this in terms of as a restaurant. So if you think about a wonderful restaurant offering a lot of different types of seating and as well as a lot of a variety of a menu. So one of the best feeder options that I've had good luck with is what we call platform feeders. The one on the left, you can see it's more of one that would hang from a pole as opposed to the one on the right is a pole mount. So it's a threaded screw underneath that keeps it secured. But a platform feeder, the benefit of this type of feeder is you can offer a variety of foods, excuse me, on the platform. So you could mix maybe chunks of suet with black oil sunflower seed. And it's great for those birds like the cardinals that I call them the booth seeders. They like to be seated and you know sit there for a while and dine where other birds are more of the takeout, grab and go. Like for example, the titmouse in that left-hand picture would stop, get a seed and off it would go. So this offers a nice variety of food as well as seeding the platform feeder. Two feeders um, on the other hand are more specialized. So they also can specialize in what type of food that's offered depending on the structure of the port of the, of the openings. So for example, the one in the middle is what we um, would really be using to entice the goldfinch. So to thinking to Lisa's point, maybe something like this would entice goldfinch because they are around. If you're in the Northeast, you def we definitely have goldfinch around. And this was filled with uh, Niger thistle. So you can, it's really hard to even see the port of the little opening because it's a small little slit that the bird would stick its thin bill in to grab one of those tiny seeds. So that's one strategy, Lisa, to think about maybe to entice the goldfinch. So two feeders are nice because uh, another thing that you can do if you're being plagued with the house sparrows or other larger birds that are sort of overtaking your feeders and you want to in, really bring in those smaller finch, you can actually cut the posts down a little bit with either a hacksaw. Um, I've had to do this and in, in make it so that the post is actually closer or shorter to the tube so that some of the larger birds aren't able to get a good perch. So there's a, a benefit um, to try to narrow down who actually is coming to the tube feeder. Suet feeders are a really popular option. Many of them are wire material covered with a plastic or rubber coating to kind of protect it from rusting. So it's a safety issue as well for the birds. It's a way to keep the, that material from becoming a, a health hazard. Suet feeders are nice because anytime you get those sort of prefab suet cakes, you can get them, you know, local grocery stores even, or um, any of your garden centers, you can get a whole package of them and they're easy to just pop right in the feeder. So I, I like those for ease. But sewer feeders attract actually a wide variety of birds. We think of them for primarily woodpeckers, but I've seen my bluebirds, they adore my suet feeders, especially if, if it kind of caps the top. They, they don't have the ability to really cling as well to the side like a woodpecker, but they sit right there and they will eat the suet. Suet, of course, being beef fat, it's an extremely high energy, high protein source of food. It's really relished by quite a few birds, especially as we get into these cold winter months where, again, keeping those energy, energy demands met is critical. Um, this is the, the type of feeder I was referring to before when I said I saw the pine siskin. It's a window mount feeder, so they're great. They're typically made of a plexiglass material, which makes them very easy to clean. And we'll talk about cleaning strategies in a moment. They suction cup right on the window so that the beauty of it is the birds become used to you for the most part. I have this one that's on the left and it's nice because I can offer different types of seed. I can put uh, one type of seed on sort of the left little compartment and something different on the right but they're, they're fun. I have one in my kitchen window, so it kind of explains why I have water everywhere when I'm washing dishes, because I'm usually glued to who's out on the feeder. 
they're um, they come in all different sizes. You can get small little ones, or you can get the bigger size with with several different compartments. Okay, so we think about um, ways to offer the best selection of food to entice the biggest or the most variety of birds to your feeders. Again, to think about that restaurant analogy, if you have a full service menu, you tend to attract more, more patrons. So the thistle is that, um, Niger thistle is the second one down. That is the picture that's on the left, tiny, tiny little seeds. And you can offer that in the tube feeder that we saw a moment ago, or even a mesh stock that's designed specific, specifically for thistle. Um, it's called black gold is its nickname because it tends to be very expensive. A little bit of it goes a long way, but it's really prized by the, the finch community. You can also get um, suet in the meat department if, if you can find it. It seems to be hard to find lately, but having just pure suet is a great option for those situations where you may not have a baffle to prevent squirrels from coming up and getting the suet cakes that have the seeds. And we'll talk about squirrels and how to mitigate um, their, uh, their challenge in a moment. Nia, yeah, the one that I find is the most popular is the third one in the black oil sunflower seed. This is, you can get 20 pound, 40 pound, 50 pound bags for uh, relatively inexpensive. Of course, like our own food prices have gone up, so has the price of bird seed too. But I look at it as an investment in my entertainment and my sanity because sitting there watching the birds is my favorite way uh, to really decompress and, and sort of calm down and focus and, and observe. So black oil is a great thing to offer. Many birds really love this. So it's probably the most popular if you want to attract the widest variety of birds. I think black oil um, is the way to go. And then millet, this one on the top right is a seed. Then I know I've used it in different baking things that I've done. I can get it at a bulk in uh, you know, bulk bags at my local garden center. And that's a favorite of the juncos. So after I shovel out the feeders in the winter time, for example, I put a whole cup full of millet out and the juncos are right there. And also the morning doves love it and any of your other ground feeders. Okay, attracting bluebirds. I just have to do a, a quick little note on this because to me, it's, it's just one of my most special things that's, that's happened. Mealworms, dried mealworms, again, you can get them in bulk either online or at some of your garden centers have them. And bluebirds, uh, they can't resist mealworms and they tend to be a little bit expensive. So if you're offering mealworms for bluebirds, I would recommend that you get a special feeder. It's, a, it's like a domed plexiglass feeder. And the one that's featured here in the center photo, it has a thread in that post. So you're you're able to bring the dome down a little bit. And this is what finally saved me because the blue, the blue jays were consuming probably a dollar's worth of mealworms every pass at the feeder when I had them on the platform. So I did get a feeder like that and I was able to lower that dome just enough that the small birds like a bluebird could fly up and under, but the blue jays were not able to navigate in there. So that really made the difference for me. But uh, bluebirds are very much attracted to suet as well as these mealworms. Okay, just a quick little note um, about leaving, again, your seed heads for the birds, because this is, of course, the natural food source for many of these birds that we're looking at. And it's winter interest for your gardens. It's, it's increasing the, the ecological value. And it's just fun to see who comes to the seed heads that you leave. So you can leave them for the winter time. And then once temperatures get above 50 degrees in the spring, that's the, the best time to clean up your garden. So you're preserving all the little invertebrates that are there all winter long. Okay, another thing to think about, um, we talked a lot about food and how to offer food the best way, but without fresh water, uh, your yard isn't just as enticing as it can be. Think about when we have those bitter cold temperatures and things are frozen and it may not be snow available. Birds need water every day. Most living things need to have a fresh source of water. So by offering a heated bird bath, if you're in the particular part of the country where water would freeze if you offered it, is really a great way to, again, make your yard enticing and sort of a full service restaurant for these birds. 
And there are many different styles that are out there now that you can get online or even some of the, um, the big box stores have them. So there's a deck mount here where it has the internal heating element within the bowl. I have this one that's in the middle, which has the internal heating element right in the bowl. And it's nice because the bowl does actually unscrew to dump out the water and just do a quick pass with a brush to kind of clean it and refill it. It's very easy. Another option is the one on the left that has the external uh, heating element. So this is great for if you have a stone bird bath or uh, a metal bird bath. Be careful with your ceramic bird baths if you're actually in an area where you'll get frozen water. You want to make sure that um, those are probably tucked away safely because they will crack if they're allowed to um, freeze over. And make sure you anchor that external element with a rock because otherwise it will flip over and end up in the snow. And I can speak for experience on all of this. Okay, another thing to think about is shelter because birds, again, need to roost someplace during the day or even in the evening. So it's important for them to have a sheltered area. Um, and to speak to Lisa's, I think whoever had the cat question, it wasn't you, Lisa, you were the cardinal and the goldfinch. But in terms of um, providing a safe environment for your birds at the feeders, ideally you'd want to have some type of shelter that they could escape to pretty quickly if there was a, a hawk that came through or some other predator, for example, a cat but I wouldn't have these particular things right up close to the feeders. So again, any birds would be able to notice a cat that might be prowling around, but having it relatively nearby so they can escape and seek shelter, I think is really important. I love to go around after um, the Christmas season is over and the trees are all out for collection in my neighborhood. I grab them and I drag them down the street, put them up in my woods, I tether them to the trees and um, I used to get some very curious looks from not only my family, but neighbors when the drag marks in the snow, but I love creating this little Christmas tree farm in my woods and so that the birds use that as a shelter for the rest of the winter. So be creative. Think, re repurpose your Christmas tree if you have a live one. Okay, cleaning. This is really an important piece. Um, just like any good restaurant or our own kitchen, having a sanitized situation is key to mitigating any type of disease or illness. And it's really important to be disinfecting all of your feeders on a regular basis. What I do is every two weeks, I take the feeders in at night, I dump out any seed. If it's just dry, I dump it in the woods. If it's been wet from snow or rain, I put it in the trash make sure everything is dumped out. And then I soak the feeders and I have a big, big bucket. I soak it in a, a solution of one part bleach, nine parts warm water. And I leave that for about 20 minutes to 40 minutes, sometimes an hour. And then I have a good selection of cleaning brushes that I make sure that all of the debris is really cleaned off. So the feeders look like they're almost new. And then to make sure that you're rinsing quite well any of the bleach solution or any of the remaining little pieces of seed off and let dry very thoroughly overnight, let them dry, and then you can restock them in the morning. So it's important to do that on a regular basis. I do it every two weeks. I set a notice in my phone, so it's just becoming a part of habit. And the other thing that's important too is to rake underneath your feeders so that any of the droppings, you're periodically raking the discarded seed where some of the birds may be actually congregating uh, take that in, and put it in the trash bag. I have a special rake and a dustpan and brush. So I'm cleaning up underneath the feeders so that I'm providing the most sanitized situation that I can. Okay, in terms of disease, um, the house finch, as I mentioned earlier, were not originally from the east part of this country. And so that low genetic diversity that they have, it makes them very susceptible to disease. And there's one disease that just be on the lookout for this. It's called the um, avian, uh, avian conjunctivitis. It's actually a respiratory disease, but what it does is it affects the eyes of the bird so that they become swollen and crusty. And, and it can, in severe instances, lead to blindness. Um, some birds do recover, but it, it, it makes them more susceptible to predation. If you do happen to notice birds, particularly the house finch that look like this at your feeders, the best thing to do is to immediately Take your feeders down, discard any of the seed, and disinfect your feeders uh, just like you normally would do on your, uh, your two-week rotation and leave the feeders in for about a week. And hopefully that um, 
the ill bird will probably succumb to the natural elements or predation and just keep a lookout. And you can report it to local authorities too, because they are interested in tracking this, particularly like Cornell Lab of Ornithology or any of our wildlife agencies within the state. Okay, challenges, squirrels. Um, I've been outwitted by so many squirrels. I question, do I even have an IQ as high as a squirrel? They can be extremely frustrating. Squirrels have an incredible sense of smell and determination like nobody's business. Um, the best thing to do with squirrels is to, I'm gonna to flip to this uh, slide, is to use a baffle. A baffle is that metal, it's like either a pie plate or some type of barrier on a pole so a squirrel is not able to get up and access your feeders. So definitely I would recommend that. The other thing to consider is that squirrels um, are able to jump. So you need to make sure that you have probably a seven foot circumference of jump free space around your feeders. So take a look at any branches. Do you have a picnic table? Do you have something that is a launch point? So if you're new to putting up a feeder situation, kind of do some surveillance before um, you really anchor a pole into the ground. But baffles are really incredibly effective. If all else fails, um, my mother-in-law has been had success with the type of seed that's coated with like a cayenne or red pepper, which deters squirrels. It bothers the nasal passages. So it birds aren't bothered by it because they don't really have an incredible sense of smell. But that is something that um, has saved her sanity is to put out the, the type of seed that has that cayenne. It's like a hot pepper. Um, there's lots of varieties you can find online or even at your local garden centers. But baffles are really the only thing that work, in my opinion, with squirrels. Um, bears, we talked about that briefly. Um, bears have one of the strongest sense of smell of any land mammal, an incredible memory, and they are looking to fatten up in preparation for hibernation. And what is more delicious than a big feeder full of black ball sunflower seeds, them, I don't know. But fish and game here in New Hampshire has set an arbitrary date of December 1st to be able to safely put your feeders out if you're in sort of an area where a bear would frequent and leave them out all night. I would question that now again, given the fact that it's been 53 degrees here in New Hampshire over the last couple of days. So my feeders have come back in because um, it needs to be certain temperatures for those bears to go into hibernation. So that's just an arbitrary date. Use Use sort of your knowledge of your local habitat, the weather conditions. And on the back end of the winter, it used to be April 1st would be a, a time they recommend taking your feeders in and not leaving them out. Again, I've been uh, had bear take my feeder down in early March. It depends on the weather and we know our weather and our climate are changing. So just be, be aware if you do have bear in your area, please just keep an eye on that before you leave your feeders out all night or put them out. Um, window strikes. This is a, a real big challenge to birds. They see the reflection of the woods or habitat. They don't see the glass, so they think it's a safe place to fly, especially if they're looking to escape predation by a hawk at a bird feeder situation, for example. So if you notice like this picture on the left here that looks like it has powder of a bird imprint, there was a bird strike there and often it's it's stunned almost like knocking the wind out of itself um, and it will lie on the ground below the window. But it's, um, it's really something to address and basically what you will want to do is to mitigate that reflection. So it could be putting up some type of stickers. I've actually moved sort of plants in front of the windows. Um, take a look at the windows that you suspect may be a problem. You might need to move your feeders away from that because it might be in the direct line of a bird fleeing from a potential predator at your bird feeders. So do some detective work. And if you're noticing birds window strikes, try to change where your feeders are. Um, experts recommend that feeders should be at least 25 feet away from your house or within three feet of your house. That's why I love those little suction cup glass, you know, the window feeders that I showed you earlier because birds have a purpose, a reason to fly to them. So it's, they're not mistaking that they can fly through it. They're going there for a reason. But again, do detective work um, to make sure that you're mitigating any of these window strikes. Hawks. Again, we do have hawks, little hawks that are, um, that feed on songbirds. And what better place to come to dine than a bird feeder situation where there's lots of birds. 
oftentimes hawks are getting the weaker, the older, the ill members of uh, a flock. So they're actually doing a service in, this, in the sense of they're sort of keeping, keeping all the, the fit and active birds and the healthy birds, the populations, um, they, they sort of are Darwin at its best, the survival of the fittest. But if you're finding that there's really a big problem, take your feeders in for uh, a couple of weeks and that hawk most likely will move on when there's no longer a ready source of food. Okay, cats, we did address this a little bit, but I can't emphasize enough the importance of, um, if you do have an outdoor cat, first of all, it's safest and healthiest for your cat to be a house cat. But if you do have an outdoor cat, I really implore you, please do not put bird feeders out. It really is not fair to the birds and it's not fair to your cat to present that situation to them. And there's no such thing as my cat isn't hungry, so it's not going after the birds. It's a, it's a well-honed instinct um, to, to go after something that's moving like a bird would move. Um, so I really encourage you to make bird feeding something that you enjoy, that brings you a sense of calm and peace and really gives you an opportunity to, to get away from the devices, put your phone down. If you're someone like me that oftentimes has to be on a laptop for work, this is a great way to stretch your eyes from a screen to something outside in nature. Um, I oftentimes will grab a cup of coffee, bundle up and sit on a camp chair away from my feeders. So I'm outside hearing the birds and enjoying the fresh air in that respect. So I I hope that you enjoyed this tonight. You've got, you've got a few little, pieces of information or nuggets to make your bird feeding situation more successful. Just one final comment is make sure that the most important thing is that you're keeping up with the sanitation of your feeders. That's something incumbent upon us offering the situation to these birds, these wild animals, that we keep it as clean and healthy for them as we possibly can. And Kelly, we have some questions. Sure. Go through them. I just held on to all of them. So just a confirmation, Patty wants to confirm, finches are going to peck through and they will take seeds from those tube feeders, correct? Yes, they will. Um, especially Patty, if you have uh, the one that's ready for the thistle, it's a little slot and they absolutely will stick that little tiny bill in or that beacon and grab those seeds, they can't resist. Okay, as far as the predators, you talked about hawks and bears and squirrels and all that stuff, but what about wild turkeys? Is there well, yes, the turkeys. Um, I actually had a situation this summer where I had wild turkeys in my yard and that the male was so smart. He knew um, looking up at my platform feeder, all he had to do was jump and he would knock it with his head and the seeds would come down. So um, again, I felt like I'm outwitted by a squirrel, now a wild turkey. So I did take the feeders in for a bit and the turkeys actually moved on into the woods. Another thing you can do to mitigate turkeys visiting is to make sure you're actually breaking up any of the uh, fallen seed on the ground. So it's less enticing for them. Okay, um, we had a question about, are there plants that you can plant to attract marsh birds? Marsh birds, mm. uh, probably cattails and any of the sedges that would be native for your area. So that would be great to consult your local, your state um, cooperative extension or a state university that would do that type of planting. I know here, for example, in, in New Hampshire, we have University of New Hampshire, the cooperative extension, but there's lots of resources by, by uh, geographic region on where to get native plants for different um, purposes of feeding wildlife. Somebody had asked, um, what can we do to help migrating birds? Uh, a couple of things. One of them is, is really something you wouldn't think of and it goes in your coffee mug. By providing, by purchasing bird or shade, shade grown coffee is one of the best things that we can do with that passive role because those are um, coffee, plantations that are actually preserving the, the shade habitat that our migrating songbirds are going to spend the winter in. So the power of your pocketbook, purchasing shade grown coffee, um, bird friendly shade grown coffee is a, a huge thing you can do. Um, another thing is to try to keep those windows that might be a window strike situation as mitigated as possible. 
is a thing that you can do migrating birds oftentimes are migrating in low light times in early morning or late afternoon where the reflection, the time that they're migrating is the strongest. So any of those windows that have been a problem in the past, seed it to make sure that they have decals and some type of uh, interruption to them. Okay. Um, Maria wanted to know, does the cayenne, even though they don't smell it, does it affect the bird's metabolism? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know conclusively if it does or doesn't. I suspect it wouldn't because I know there's been a lot of research on that, but I don't know a confirmed answer on that. Um, somebody wants question. to know, I'm oh, sorry, do you have a blog or social media site where they can follow all your information? And I do. I don't know if, um, if that's something that I... I'll defer to Mary. I have that on the next slide that I have. Uh, so I know with um, my relationship with AARP, I'm here as someone working with AARP, not really to promote my own um, business. So um, you can Google me at natureeducationopportunities.com and then we'll leave it at that. Okay, a um, couple more. First sure. of all, somebody said, why do we see a lot of birds sometimes eating and eating and eating, and then we don't see them for days? Where do they go? <laughs> they basically are enjoying the wild food in the woods and the fields. Um, and again, weather de determines a lot of those patterns. If it's going to be a rainy, snowy, awful day, the birds will take the path of least resistance and visit our feeders. Mm -hmm. Okay. And somebody asked about the feed saying the basic mix of bird seed that we see in the stores, you know, like the dollar stores or whatever, even, you know, Home Depot, does that, con it's, does that have a lot of filler? Is it not our best choice? Yeah, that, that's the thing. Like any of those sort of blends, wild food blend, it has a lot of what we call the red millet, which not even the morning doves, which are really an incredible ground feeder will eat. So it's best, I think, to buy pure black oil sunflower seed, pure millet, and make your own mix. Um, those do have a lot of filler. That's an excellent point. And you could have a lot of discarded seed that just sits um, and it can be a potential breeding ground for bacteria or disease. I, I found when I use the mixes, um, the birds, if they don't like stuff, they just throw it on the ground. Like it's, And I must have had a half to an inch of thistle on my ground yeah. because yeah. they just didn't like that stuff. Right. Um, you talked about the house finch and the purple finch, but somebody kind of wants to know what is the difference besides their coloring? Um, different species in different geographic range. Like the, the house finch again was a species that is native to the Western part of this state, was introduced by being let go from pet shops here. And the purple finch is a, is a bird that is native to the Northeast. It's a state bird of New Hampshire. So different species, um, but both beautiful songs. Okay, two last things, and then we can wrap it up, I think, because I seem to be getting most of my questions answered. Um, Carol said she'd love a follow-up for questions, changes, observations. In other words, she wants you to come back, I think, and talk about this some more. So that's not something I don't think that you can answer, except that you'd be willing, but Mary, maybe we could put that on the list. Sure, and I would encourage everybody who's still listening to be the consummate observer. Again, having your binoculars, a notepad, what are the weather conditions on the day you're observing? Um, and there are different, I'll mention quickly, um, I know New Hampshire Audubon does it, the Backyard Bird Survey, and Cornell Ornithology does it. Citizen science, the data that you're collecting as just a casual backyard observer is highly valuable to continue to protect vulnerable species, look at patterns. So all in the name of science, grab your binoculars, your coffee, and sit down and make some great observations. And I have my own question, which is I use Vaseline on my bird poles and I just watch the squirrels slide down. Um, is that something I shouldn't be doing? It doesn't have I any probably, on the birds. I wouldn't, it? I was only in the sense of like, um, I think about in the, the off season, if you had a bird rub against it or insects get stuck to it. Um, yeah, I probably wouldn't do Vaseline because it's certainly not gonna deter a squirrel. Um, oh. They're like a firefighter going down the pole. So a baffle is really the best thing. Okay. All right. I mean, they, them. It does keep them. They actually slide right down and then I clean it and I redo it. But anyhow, I think that's the end of our questions. I won't use the Vaseline on my pools. Um, Kelly, I thank actually, you. 
thank you for buy... sharing your time and expertise with us though tonight. Sure. It's been it Beverly, really Steph, been... do you have a question? No, I was just gonna say when you buy a, if you buy like um an angel food cake in, in a bakery in the store and that cover the top part of that, yes. you can poke a hole in that and use it as a baffle and they work pretty well. Oh, that's ingenuity, Yankee ingenuity. And, and the price finest. is right. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. <laughs> and Pamela says she connect, she connects a slinky to her pole. I'm not sure how that works, but she says it works really well. That. <laughs> but I guess the squirrel winds up going like this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> then they have the ones that have the battery operated thing that spins when a squirrel gets on them too. It, it is. I mean, squirrels are just, they're the number one source of enjoyment and source of irritation mm -hmm. at the feeders. Because again, I've been outwitted by so many of them. It's embarrassing to even admit it. But the baffle situation has been my savior. Alrighty. Well, you're getting lots of hands and love and hearts and all oh, that. Well, thank you, everyone. It's exciting to have this kind of uh, enthusiasm for this topic. Yeah. Birds are wonderful. They're a great hook to connect with nature. So let me wrap us up then. Again, thank you for being here with us tonight, coming back again. We really appreciate it. We really learned so much tonight. Um, our audience, thank you for joining us. We hope that you did learn, that you enjoyed this presentation, and that you create a safe and fun place for your birds in your backyard and that this information you'll share with others and it'll be valuable to you. Be sure to check out our website, aarp.org slash nh, and you can find out other programs, virtual programs, in-person programs. And we have a couple shred coming up. And we also, um, we're gonna have another virtual chat with Kelly in February about animal romance, just as the time is getting ready for them <laughs> animals to start returning to, um, to the spring. So anyway, Thank you again, be well, be careful, and we'll see you hopefully at more AARP presentations. Oh, Happy holidays, question, everyone. Mary, when will this video be posted, in a couple days? Yes, so the video will be posted in a couple days. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night, good night. everyone. Thank you. Uh, good night, thank you, Kelly.